Good afternoon. I am Alan Solomont, the Dean of Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. Welcome to today's Distinguished Speaker Series, featuring a conversation with Latosha Brown. I want to thank the co-sponsors of today's event, the Africana Center, Jumbo Vote, the Political Science Department, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Dr. Kerry Greenridge, Greenidge, the Andrew Mellon Assistant Professor of Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora here at Tufts will moderate today's conversation. We have hosted some exciting speakers this seed semester, including Pete Buttigieg, Deval Patrick, Ioma Uluo, Congressman Joe Kennedy, Yamish Alcindor, and Van Jones, just to name a few. And we have more great speakers and guests coming this semester. Tomorrow, we are co-sponsoring a discussion about the free press with Stephen Kirchian, an investigative reporter and a founder of the Boston Globe Spotlight team. In November, we'll hear from Congressman Adam Schiff, actor and Tufts alumnus Hank Azaria, and former United States Ambassador Norm Eisen, who served as special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee during the impeachment proceedings against President Trump. You can register for those events and see the full lineup of speakers at tishcollege.tufts.edu slash events. Remember also to share this with your friends, with faculty, with family, and with classmates. This year we have witnessed the unprecedented convergence of a global pandemic, a national reckoning with racial injustice, and one of the most consequential presidential elections. Any of those events would have prevent, presented a formidable challenge to activists and organizers who are fighting to create a more just and equitable world. These three together have made this a uniquely trying moment that has required a singular energy and ingenuity from those working at the intersection of these major crises in American life. Our guest today is just such an activist, and I look forward to hearing her perspective on working for racial justice and political engagement in 2020. Latosha Brown is a veteran community organizer and political strategist who co-founded the Black Voters Matter Fund, an organization whose aim is to increase the political power in marginalized and predominantly Black communities. A native of Alabama, Latosha has dedicated her life to supporting the development of community-based institutions in the South and especially in the Black Belt and the Gulf Coast. She has more than 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit in philanthropy sectors on issues related to social justice, economic development, leadership development, wealth creation, and civil rights. Latosha is the founder of the Saving Ourselves Coalition, a community-led disaster relief organization that helped hundreds of families in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. She also founded the Southern Black Women Organizing Project that works to strengthen the network of Black women who are grassroots leaders in the South. In addition, she is a founding member and former executive director of the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors Gulf Coast Fund for Community Renewal and Ecological Health. Latosha is also the principal owner of Truth Speaks Consulting, a professional facilitation and philanthropy advisory consulting business based in Atlanta. For more than 25 years, she has served as a consultant and advisor to individual donors, various public foundations, and private donors. Latosha has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Lewis E. Burnham Award for Human Rights, the 2008 Emory Business School MLK Service Award, and the 2011 White House Champion of Change Award. Last fall, she was a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Institute of Politics. Joining Latosha for today's conversation is Dr. Kerry Greenidge, the Andrew W. Mellon Assistant Professor of Race, Colonial, 
colonialism and diaspora at Tufts. Kerry is the co-director of the African American Trail Project at the Tufts Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Her research explores the role of African American literature in the creation of radical black political consciousness, particularly as it relates to local elections and democratic populism during the progressive era. She is the author of Boston Abolitionists and most recently, Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. Her work has also included historical research for the Wiley Blackwell Anthology of African American Literature, the Oxford African American Studies Center, and PBS. I want to thank Kerry for leading today's conversation and thank our distinguished speaker, Latosha Brown, for joining us as part of Tisch College's Distinguished Speaker Series. So let's get started. Thank you so much. Thank you and welcome everybody. I am so excited to be here. Um, if you'd like to ask a question of our guests on screen with your video on, please type your question in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen, rather than in the chat. We will respond to your question in the Q&A box if your question is chosen and we will promote you to panelists so you will be visible on screen to our speakers. I will prompt you to ask your questions. Once your question is answered, you'll be demoted from panelists back to attendee for the remainder of the event. So thank you, everybody. Uh, just make sure that you're using the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. I am so delighted, so delighted uh, to talk to uh, Ms. Brown today. I have to confess, when you had your Washington Post editorial, it was um, one of the things that myself and my 13-year-old niece uh, talked a lot about in terms of what you're, how you're going about and, and your, your statements on black women and the vote and the significance that black women and me have had um, for President Biden. So I'm so excited and uh, to invite you here today. Thank you for having me. I am, you all caught me in the thick of things that, yes. you know, we are six days out from an election. And so um, I'm sitting here um, on our campaign bus in the middle of a parking lot um, in Flint, Michigan. Yeah. And I have fresh stories from the road for the last, last 30 days of what I've seen and you know what I'm experiencing as we're working really hard to strengthen, save, and expand democracy. Oh, wonderful. What, what are some of the things I know right before we started, I had a chance to ask you uh, how things were going in Flint. And your first response was something that I, I always say when people, I'm not from the area, but say, and you said, well, Flint, the water's still not on. Like there's not, there's still not, it's, it hasn't gone away, the, this, this entrenchment of undrinkable water and the treatment there. So what, what are your response as you're driving your bus as we speak in that area? What are your, um, your initial reactions to sort of the people or the people's reactions as you're making your way through the area? You know, it's interesting. We have been, um, people have been calling us all day. We've been talking to folks in Flint. We're actually getting ready to go do some campaign and some caravanning out in the community. What's interesting, there's this energy and this spirit in Michigan where people are, particularly in the African-American community, which is the constituency group that we work with, are very determined and committed around organizing on the vote this election cycle. And so in some in, in a, some really interesting ways, you know, while there is a lot of concern and citizen, cynicism that we're hearing about the political process, you know, almost similar to, as you made reference to um, the op-ed that I did in the New York Times, I mean, in the Washington Post, you know, black women are, I, I just gotta admit that black women are leading the charge and on the front lines yep. of saving the, um, on the vanguard of saving democracy in this country everywhere we've gone you know it's interesting on yesterday we were in detroit yep. and there was a um, group of men that we met with earlier and it was a wonderful discussion right and but we were talking about kind of the ideas and what people should do what people shouldn't do and then the next meeting we had was a meeting with women all of the women were like, oh yeah, I've been working X, Y, Z and talking about yeah. ideology. Yeah. And it was so interesting last night, one of the young members of my staff 
right, came in and he was like, you know, I'm, I just got to acknowledge women are doing the work. He was like, I was so frustrated today. He was like, we were in the room and the men, I mean, they sound good. But the <laughs> women, we went to the meeting with the women. Now that's not in any way am I saying or trying to imply that men are doing work, right? Exactly. Um, matter of fact, I work with at one of the hardest working human beings on the face of the earth, um, Cliff Albright, who is a co-founder and my partner in Black Voters Matter. But what I will say is there is a certain kind of way that women are showing up right now, I think because we sit uniquely at this intersection of sexism and racism, you know, I, and we've mm -hmm. had to navigate those waters. I think it has fired us up and prepared us for a moment like this. I, I absolutely is so, so, so true. And I, one of the, one of the things I loved about your Washington Post uh, piece was this idea that um, and making people or the public reckon with what most of us who study politics, historians, and just black women generally understand, which is that black, black women are the backbone of um, uh, progressive democratic politics, right? And one of the things, a bunch of the things that you pointed out in that op-ed was this notion that what Biden should do, right? Um, if President, if um, Vice President Biden were elected uh, next week, and you pointed to, you know, uh, uh, vice presidency, you pointed to Supreme Court, um, and right or after that was when uh, Kamala Harris was announced as the as the VP. So, um, what do you see as the possibilities um, if? Uh, Joe Biden wins the presidency on Tuesday in terms of African American women, and just in, in terms of the country. What do you think? What do you think is the is the possibilities for um, Black women's politics and just uh, politics in general? If that if that were to happen. Well, well, let me say this, and I want to raise this in context of I am not raising this in the context of partisanship. I am raising this in the context of what is factual, that we have had a president. We currently have a president who has been openly aggressive and disrespectful to black women in particular. We can go from black women reporters to negative things that he said towards women in general um, mm -hmm. and to black women. We can go, you know, my, my, there is a certain kind of environment, I think, that has been set and a tone that has been set mm -hmm. um, that has been steeped in both racism and extreme misogyny and sexism. And so sitting in that space that's been very that's not just like an opinion or a partisan yeah. issue for us that's traumatic that's yeah. been hurtful to our community and so i think part of the reason why you see so many black women like leading work and women across the board because i am seeing women of every walk of life yeah. work in ways that i'm not seeing in the other elections but i think because we know what is at stake and so what I think is what what I think that there's two kind of answers for the next six days and then the, then the seventh day, you know, on on these first six days, I think that women are just like everywhere we've been going. Women have been working everywhere overwhelmingly when I'm looking at poll workers, when I'm looking at poll watchers, when I'm looking at people who are literally doing the work on the ground, it is disproportionately women. Right. And so that's been across the board. That's been my experience and what I've witnessed. Now, that may not be in other communities, but that's what I've seen and witnessed. Yep. In addition to that, I think so these next six days, I think what we're going to see is we're going to see the organizing power, the strength um, and the commitment to democracy that women have. You know, I think on the seventh day, I think it is going to be regardless of, you know, I think there are going to be multiple scenarios, but regardless of what the outcome is on the seventh day, I think women all know we got work to do, right? That, that while I am, you know, I am, was, I'm extremely happy that Kamala Harris you know, is we as an African American woman, I want her to be in the White House, right? Like I unapologetically want her to be in the White House, and I think that that in itself is historic, right? But I also remember that as we were doing this work to push the body campaign to have a woman on the ticket, I have not forgotten the headlines that said she should mm -hmm. be vice president because she was ambitious. I've not yep. forgotten it. I've not no, forgotten or, or, the headlines. Or, 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 
recent criticism, just to get back to that, I mean, I think it's so, so wonderful and powerful what you pointed out, which is this notion that women, and particularly black women, have paid attention um, to the facts, again, as you're saying, of what the, how this president has talked about women and African-American women in particular. And so this notion uh, that came out was that Kamala Harris was too ambitious. That was right when she was, uh, she was uh, announced uh, to be the VP. Um, nominee, but also this notion that recently came out about criticizing that she's dancing on the stage and, 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 and notions like that, you know, that when she's going out to a campaign. So I think it's very, very powerful that you're pointing out uh, what you're pointing out there. But go ahead. I just wanted to, wanted to give a shout out to Ellie, that. You're absolutely right. It's really interesting. It's interesting because we saw her dancing one day and a couple of days later, I saw these memes of Trump dancing. And I'm like, well, yes. what gives the freedom of one to dance and the other one can't dance? Exactly. Right? What gives the freedom of... And so part of that, you know, I do think that there is, we are in this transitional moment in this country. I believe the Pandora's box has been open. Women are going to go to their rightful place. Where is that? That is to lead. I think yeah. that we are really clear about that the country without our voices, right? Without our energy, without our leadership is severely handicapped. Yeah. And so I am seeing young women be bold in their leadership to challenge systems to come outside of the box of partisanship, become outside of the box of what is uh, politically correct and really be able to show bold leadership. And so I think we're gonna continue this in all across this nation. I think part of it is out of a need. I think part of it is, I do there think that, that things, it's about timing as well. Um, I also believe, you know, at, here is a woman that was called, you know, out of her name because she was in a debate, yep. right? And so when we're, we're, we're looking at the way that women are attacked for asserting ourselves in leadership, that the only thing that is going to change that is we're going to have to get America used to seeing women in leadership. That's the solution yep. to that. Yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Amen. You're absolutely, absolutely correct. One of, one of the... Um, things I also wanted to ask you, just going back, because this, this is for like some of my students who asked, where, you were originally from Alabama, and so what has it been like um, that um, you're organizing grassroots um, Black communities in that belt that um, is sort of the heart of uh, African-American and African-American history and consciousness? Um, what has that been like as somebody who's from Alabama? What, 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 can you speak a little bit to where, you know, what, what inspires you and how it feels like to be inspired by that community? Um, because I, one of the things I always, I always look to is, you know, the power and the strength of building a grassroots movement in that belt that we see on the, on the map, um, you know, going back to the 19th century. What has that felt like and, and what is, can you speak a little bit to how you're inspired um, by that? Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started exactly. to fight, to rise on the prize and hold on, yes, hold yes. on. You know, the inspiration that I need is recognizing that I am sitting right here before you all. I am engaged with this sister who you are a professor, that you and I are in our position. Yep. There were sisters before us who were wet nurses, who were literally feeding babies at their breasts milk that was for their own children that was for sold on auction block. I am sitting here because there was some sister in a field that had just been raped, that her family had just been destroyed, yet mm -hmm. she continued to have hope to survive and to live and still had a prayer in her heart exactly. for generations exactly. like me. I'm sitting here because I got the benefit of going to college and the yep. benefit of having a job and buying a house in the neighborhood that I wanted to live in because my grandmother, who was born in 1910, the mm -hmm. majority of her life, she actually washed folks' clothes just so that she could feed her family. But yep. what she was anchored in is this strong belief that yep. she had value, that she mm -hmm. had humanity, mm -hmm. and there was something greater working for her on yep. her behalf. And so I pulled my strength from those women, 
from the history of the line of women that uh, in spite of the abuse, in spite of the racism, in spite of the misogynies, they still rose. And mm -hmm. I am a reflection of the work that all of them did. I am benefiting from that. So who am I to say that I'm tired? Who exactly. am I to say somebody exactly. like Trump gonna make me stop? Exactly. Like, so I think, I think for me, I draw my strength on the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Harriet mm -hmm. Tubmans and the and the many many unknown um, unnamed women that literally mm -hmm. continue to take care and nurture this country and feed this country and to show mm -hmm. up in their best selves. Mm -hmm. I come from a legacy and a line yep. of women that when we didn't have anything else, we had a song in our heart. We had a belief that there was some greater power that was operating for us. And we had a little bit of hope. And I know that that in itself, if that can make people survive atrocious attacks on humanity, then that's where I draw my strength from. Amen. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I, thank you so much. I, I, I just, um, in terms of you say I'm a professor, and it's like, you know, I, there's, there's thousands of women, black women whose, whose footsteps I march in um, to be able to be here and be able to talk to you and, and talk to students. So I, I thank you so much for that. What, what, what made you become an activist? What made you become an activist? You know, I don't know when I became an activist. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, I, I, it's, it's, um, it's funny. It reminds me of, um, the movie I was born this way. I guess I don't know. Like, let me tell you. I always tell this story. I know the internet connection is really weird here. I'm not oh, sure yeah, what no, is that's happening. That's, that's all right. Um, because we're still. So I'm so sorry. I apologize for the shaky internet. Yeah, but you're doing you're doing the work. So you're you're in um, you're in. But you know, space, there were two so. things. I love to tell a story that with. We're doing the work, um, but there were two things that when I was a kid, I was always obsessed with wanting to know who was in charge. And so we would go into McDonald's or Kmart or the grocery store, and I would ask my grandmother, who owns the grocery store? Who owns Piggly Wiggly? And she would, mm -hmm. she was like, what? Well, <laughs> oh, we would go to Kmart, and I was like, who owns Kmart? I like, it was a yeah. running joke in my family that when we go in the store, yeah. she's going to ask who owns, I always had a keen sense of wanting mm -hmm. to know who had power to make decisions. I don't yep. know where I get that from, but I did. The second thing is I always, I never could stand bullies. I was a little girl and pink um, pink barrettes and patent, white patent leather shoes because my Easter shoes, I wore them half the year because I wouldn't take them off because I love my Oh Easter yes, shoes. you and me both, that, that's what, that's what, that was me um, too. You, you remember now? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and so I that was really girl that was early, my uniform. Right? But mm -hmm. if I that was my uniform, yeah. right? And 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 but it could if if I saw boys even picking on another boy, I would be the little girl with the white patent leather shoes that would mm -hmm. jump in. Yeah. Like it didn't matter. I had no concept of whether they could beat me up or whether I was stronger yeah. than them. It wasn't right. I mm -hmm. never could stand seeing people be abused. I never like to see people abuse their power. And so somewhere in this, in both of those, I think it shows I, I had some kind of, um, I, I was obsessed with really understanding power. Yep. And so I think that is like just kind of shaped through my entire life. And so as an activist, it became another vehicle for me of really being able to deal with the bullies. It became mm -hmm. a different, a vehicle for me of really being able to try to influence those who I think are in charge mm -hmm. or making sure that those are in charge are not bullies. And so I think that was like the foundation. I think the first yeah. time, um, first time that it's interesting, you know, I, if at, in the sixth grade, they didn't want us to do a, we had created a newsletter. They didn't want us to put the newsletter out. Uh -oh. And so I organized my friends and marched up to the principal's yeah. office. And so that's probably my first direct action, right? Oh, wow. Um, um, but on a social justice issue, I think my first social justice issue was in my early 20s around a uh, housing issue, around mm -hmm. a public housing issue. And so it's really interesting. I don't and where, remember, where, where was that? like, this is how I came an activist or when I grew up, I was like, I'm going to grow up and be an activist, right? 
In fact, I thought I'm going to grow up and make lots of money and be a corporate attorney and I'm going to marry Michael Jackson. Those were <laughs> my goals in life. Uh, and so, uh, so, and so ultimately what I always wanted to do is I always wanted to make things better for people. I don't, I don't care what, like I always wanted, I like to see people be happy. And so I think, believe it or not, I think that that is really what drives my activism around. And so, you know, over time, it seemed like the way for me that I wanted to show up in the world is I mm -hmm. wanted to show up in the world in, in, a, in using my power. I want to show up in the world in a way to say, hey, y'all, we can make things better. Right. We don't have to take this. And so activism, it wasn't like, like activism was the goal. Activism was the vehicle to help me fulfill my purpose. Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Wonderful. Be beautiful. And, and I can, I know we're, we're, we're talking, we're talking and they gave me all these lists of questions to ask you, but I'm just so happy to talk to you. I like threw in my own. So <laughs> apologies to the audience, but um, you founded the Black Mo Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute. Um, and you kind of got into this talking about your own genesis. But what specifically made you organize those organizations? Um, specifically, you're somebody no. who's, who stands up for bullies. But what is it that specifically those two initiatives? So back, um, Cliff Albright, who's the other co-founder, and I have been working together as activists, he, myself, and his wife, um, for a number of years in Selma, Alabama. We had worked on every issue, social justice issue, um, as activists, social justice activists around it. And so for years, you know, while we founded Black Voters Matter like three and a half years ago, the truth of the matter mm -hmm. is the, the seeds for that organization probably started more than two and a half decades ago. And so mm -hmm. we would mm -hmm. constantly sit around and talk about, you know, what it meant for Black communities to have independent political power. Yes. What would it take to get us there? And what, what, you know, and how could like our vision, our thinking about it. And so we would do little elements and pieces of it, not really thinking as an organization at the time, but just working on elections, working on races, like really testing kind of our theories and our ideas. And so mm -hmm. in 2006, 17, six, seven, 16, he and I both decided we were really frustrated with the way that we were hearing black voters talked about, particularly in the South. Mm -hmm. We were talked about as exactly. if we didn't have any power. Exactly. We were talked about as if, like, as if we were just pawns in the red and mm -hmm. the blue team game, right? And mm -hmm. so we, you know, like we decided that with our years of working in philanthropy, our years of developing systems, our years of the work that we were doing, that it was, we wanted to create an organization, quite frankly, that did two things. That one, we were able to provide some resources on the ground because we felt in many instances, if we had had resources, there yeah. were races we could have won. There were things we could have advanced. Yeah. And so that's why we started Black Voters Matter Fund. We were very intentional that we wanted to create an, a vehicle that can invest resources directly into black led groups. The second thing is, we also knew that that part of being able to um to, to really be able to tap into power is you got to organize power organized yep. power is realized power and so yep. part of what we needed to do is to really be able to create a vehicle and so we created a model right mm -hmm. that could actually help organize power and so currently we work in 15 states we have a core of 20 to 25 organizations that we work with year round in all of those states in this election cycle, over 500 organizations, we have directed resources in everything from $10,000 to $300,000 directly for them to do power building work as they see fit and determine. Yep. Not that the, not yep. based on political candidates or political parties, but as they see fit. And so what we decided, what we wanted to do is to one, help build the capacity of grassroots groups and build out the ecosystem. Two, that we would actually serve as a bringing our expertise to bear as if you had yep. like black people had a political party that we would provide mm -hmm. some infrastructure support. And then the third thing is that we would do narrative shift that we were very intentional mm -hmm. about that we were going to shift this narrative that black voters were not powerful, that black voters were just secondary, that we were going mm -hmm. to shift the national discourse 
around the importance of black voters in democracy, the importance of black voters in shaping local, state, and national um, uh, national politics. Now, I'm not so sure if we're seeing that now. I've been seeing headlines um, over the last few days of the importance of black voters in this in yes. this election. You know, I don't know how much influence we had over that process. What I can tell you mm -hmm. is that is not what we saw on the crayons in 2016. And no, so at exactly. the very least, we know that we contributed to the shift of that narrative. Exactly. I mean, I mean, the, the, the entire notion of that we've all known for a long time and historians have known and, you know, uh, people have known that, you know, black people are the, the bedrock of um, of progressive politics in 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 most of the country right and so the right. fact that that was not part of the narrative in 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 2016 and um your organization has pushed that to the help push that to the fore i mean that's just it's just amazing to see given the rhetoric i'm just thinking of you know for three or four years ago when the idea was that somehow um you know uh black people uh and particularly black southerners were you could talk about the progress of the country by keeping that sector out um you know it's it's, it's sort of it's sort of amazing so isn't that so like amazing yeah. it is amazing like, yes yeah that was like amazing it was amazing i mean i think a couple of things one because i think the majority of black voters live in the south yes. there's this idea and this framework of what is red states and blue states at the mm -hmm. end of the day people live in these states the south is only yep. red until it ain't right yeah and That's so Part of, you know, part of our work, even the work that we did in Alabama, the 2017 U.S. Senate race, you know, that race yep. shocked the country. I have been telling people that it's funny. I had colleagues of mine who worked with me in philanthropy that literally called me at that election and apologized. I mean, they, they were like, yep. I never thought in 100 years that this was possible. I was like, why? I was like, because what you were looking at is you were looking at the, the current yep landscape you were not looking at the potential in these states that had sizable yeah. black populations and that you were not yeah. looking at that neither the political parties and sometimes even the political candidates were not really engaging those groups in a way that they felt compelled to come out in record numbers which is why our work the work that we do and we have a c4 so we will support um, some mm -hmm. candidates and some campaigns, and we do some independent expenditures. But what we decided is that we would center our work on the idea that it's not about the candidates or the political parties, but it's about us. That fundamentally, when we're engaging people in the voting process, it's for them to reconnect to their power and see the potential yeah. and the power of their vote and using their own agency. Yeah, and I mean, and that's what I love about about the organization and what you do because. You know, even my own work as a historian, I look at, you know, black politics, that 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 uh, drive in the late 19th century so long ago. And it's, you know, this notion that communities themselves, particularly black communities and disenfranchised voices should decide for themselves um, how it is they're going to be represented and represent themselves. Right. And that 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 is kind of this radical notion um, that somehow black people are either the tools of one party or the or they don't vote or all, all of these things. So so thank thank you so much. Um, one of the other questions we have from photo ID requirements to excessively long lines, there is a broad spectrum of voter suppression, as we know. How can we recognize instances of voter suppression um, across the country? And I, I think this is in response to the idea that often you'll hear pundits say, well, that's just, isn't it beautiful? I mean, you know, you see these, these things, oh, isn't it beautiful that this person has to wait in line for seven hours to vote? Um, how do we kind of take the focus off of, oh, this is just a system to the idea that, you know, um, that is active voter suppression? So I think people have to, I think part of that is I think it's a lack of information. And I think given this structural racism, this is what I mean. Yeah. That mm -hmm. um, voter suppression, even in the way that it's showing up now, as a historian, you know, this isn't yeah. this it's not like America stopped voter suppression and it started back up. Exactly. Right. You exactly. know, there's been an element of voter suppression that is consistent, um, yeah. consistently happened in this country. What is what what we've seen is we've seen ebbs and flows, and we've seen yep. it in recent years, quite frankly, be intensified and more bold, right, and just kind of yep. in our face. But but let me just yep. say some um, for people to really understand the scale of what we're working with. Since 2014 to 2020, which is just six years, over 33 million Americans have been dropped from the voting rolls. Think about that. America is not a huge country. 
right? Yeah. 33 American, 33 million Americans have been dropped from the voting rolls. Now, some of that is attrition and death, but a sizable portion of, the, of those folks are people that, quite frankly, I think never should have been dropped from the voting rolls. Yeah. You know, when I look at Georgia right now, you know, in 2019, October of 2000, a year ago, um, the Secretary of State dropped 328,000 people from the voting rolls. Of yeah. those voting rolls, we actually worked with an investigative journalist, um, Greg Palace, mm -hmm. and um, a team of experts that actually do data mining work and data yeah. hygiene lists. They work for Amazon and Apple and um, um, Microsoft and Fortune 5100 companies, right? This is what they, Fortune 100 companies, this is what they do checked our list, and of the 328,000 people that were dropped from the voting rolls in Georgia, 200,000 were incorrect. And so yeah. we wanted to have our experts to sit with their experts to figure out, mm -hmm. how could you be that off? How could 200,000 of a list of 328,000 be wrong? Where did you get the, where did you get this information from? And so yeah. in an interview that they did with CNN a, a week after what we find out, is that by law, they're supposed to have a licensee with this postal yep. service that actually verifies that those lists, those address should be dropped off. Guess what? They didn't have a licensee. Exactly. So not only was it unjust, right, but it was illegal. I'm raising yep. this as we are seeing this all across this country. We, mm -hmm. are oper we operate with our, around voter suppression like we deal with racism. The way we have dealt with racism in this America, we were like, oh, that was one racist act, and that was exactly. one racist there, and there was one racist there. And then it's not Instead systemic. Of really, and it's not and systemic. It's not, that is yeah, not, exactly. Go ahead. Like, it's yeah. not structural, right? It's the same thing around voter suppression. It is a structural issue that is mm -hmm. embedded in the actual fundamental foundation of the electoral system that we have. And what we've seen is we've seen it be um, become intensified and exaggerated after the 2013 stripping of the Voting Rights Act with the yep. Shelby versus Holder case, just as yep. many of us said, right, was devastating yes, to, um, to pushing back voting rights in this country. And what we started seeing mm -hmm. is we started seeing hundreds of polling places being closed. Yep. We started seeing the pop-up of voter ID laws. Yep. We start seeing... Um, um, exact match programs where 80% mm -hmm. of the folks that we've been seeing in these exact match, particularly in Georgia and other states, are people of color. The bottom mm -hmm. line is, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Yeah, exactly. If it has all the characteristics of voter suppression, it's voter suppression, and it's not isolated incidents. It's not just Georgia. There are yep. incidents we've seen in Texas, in California, liberal California, California yeah. in New York. It New is York, a yep. strategy that has been used by folks who have been in power, uh, who know that they do not have the numbers or the people on their side that are using mm -hmm. that as a concerted, coordinated strategy to keep power by suppressing people their right to vote. Yes, exactly. And I, and I think in order, if we're seeing it that way, some of the things for us, we, there are things that we can do about that right now and that we have to demand. But first, we've got to shift our minds and from seeing that this is just isolated incident. Mm -hmm. And just look at the folks in Georgia. It is, I can guarantee you that in communities where there is a power struggle, particularly when you're talking about people of color, when you're talking about Native Americans in the Midwest, mm -hmm. or you're talking about Latinx community in Arizona, I can guarantee mm -hmm. you, you will find voter suppression in mass. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Um, as folks vote early and by mail or head to the polls to vote in person, what advice do you have um, to ensure that everyone's vote gets, gets counted? I mean, um, as people go in and vote, I voted um, by mail. Um, I'm, of course, in Massachusetts, so things are, are, are um, slightly different. But even when I, was, when I was going to vote, I noticed that there were all these confusing things popping up for people. Very subtly, but very confusing. Oh, put it in this box, and then it would change outside. Oh, no, 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 actually put it in this one. Which, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not accusing a voter that that was a voter su suppression tactic. Although I think it's like a structural thing. What would you say that people? What are you seeing on the ground, and what would your advice be to people into communities? You know, I, let me say this: whether you shoot me because you intended to shoot me, or you shoot me by accident, I got shot. And so yes. anything yes, that exactly. operates. <laughs> Anything that operates as a barrier for, to prevent people from having free and fair and open access to the ballot is just that. It is a barrier. 
like when we're seeing long lines, kind of what you raised, and I'll and I'll give my advice. You know, when we see long lines, while on one hand we're applauding people for standing in lines, how exactly. many of us can really afford to give three hours of our time to stand in line for something that should take mm -hmm. a couple of minutes? In we the middle of a pandemic, by the way. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. I we said have in, the, found in the middle of a pandemic. In the middle of Go a ahead. pandemic. Sorry. We have found ways to yep. move hundreds of thousands of people into to to watch back to watch professional sports. And we can't figure yep. out how to move people to vote. We can. Yep. It's a political wheel. That in itself is a mm -hmm. it, but seeing the lines while on one side of the story, because that's two parts of the story, yes, it is yep. indicative to people's commitment to voting. It is also indicative that something is very, very broken in this country. Um, when there's 68% yep. of black women who are hourly wage workers, every moment they're yep. standing in line, yep. they are losing wages. It has a losing financial, a economic yep. impact on them. That many women, uh, women across the board, and many people across the board are responsible for care giving right now that because of pan the pandemic, many of our children's children are at home. Many of our parents that we're concerned with that or many of our elderly folks don't want to be out because of the COVID-19. We have created a structure that people are feeling that the only way that their vote is going to get counted is if they show up to the polls. At yep. this point, because we're six days out, I don't advise anybody voting by mail. You know, I just yep. think that it's too late. It's too much of a risk at this yep. point. You know, yep. I have not counted that out as a um, as an option because I think that there are some people who certainly their health. You know, I am not. You know, while I believe in voting and liberty and give me death and give me liberty, right. I, that sounds good fundamentally. What I think what is most important is I want people to live, and yep. so I want. You know, I'm often open the option of people voting. There are some people that have to vote. Um, absentee and by mailing because of their own health and taking precautions. And so I support that. At this six yeah. days out, I think it's going to be really hard. I, I'm, I'm really, really, I'm really challenged at this point around getting people to mail in. I think that they yeah. are going to have to go vote. But I think after November 3rd, what we have to do is we've got to hold people accountable. We cannot normalize standing in line for three and four hours as if it is okay. That we have yeah. to demand of this country which calls itself the wealthiest in the world that has the resources that has the ability we can create systems that can move thousands of people right that we have to create a more efficient and effective system to the extent that this system is antiquated is because that is an intention by those who want only a small percentage of the population to participate in the process we have to be honest about that we have to call it out and we have to correct it Thank you so much. And I know uh, people are asking, people are already uh, lining up with questions and I thank you so much. Um, one of them is from uh, Richard Fultz who asks, um, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, let, me, let me go to uh, Eve Abraha first and then I will come back to you, Richard. I apologize. Um, Eve, yes. Hi, oh, thank you. Um, well, hi, I'm Eve. Uh, I just want to first say thank you for having your Black excellence here. You're awesome. And we really appreciate you putting us on the map. Um, <laughs> one of my, my question was, I know that you do a lot of like or organizing, especially like grassroots organizing. And so I just really want to ask, how, how, how can we effectively build grassroots organizations? And where do you feel like some grassroots organizations fall short when um, organizing? You know, it's funny. I, it's it's mm -hmm. interesting. I, I really have a different kind of perspective around that. You know, um, I think we have put pressure on ourselves, and I think this is a I think this is a construct of racism, that we make people of color believe that we cannot fail, that 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 we don't we that we're not allowed grace and space to grow and develop. Part of the reason why I am, I think of myself as a master organizer is because I got all kinds of scars on my back. I have failed miserably mm -hmm. <laughs> on many, many occasions. And the, all of those times of me literally failing, 
I took those as moments to really be able, they helped strengthen and sharpen my strategy. I was like, okay, okay, I can't do that. All right, okay, I got it. I can't do that. I'm saying that because there is this false sense that black folk and people of color got to be perfect, right? That we've got to yeah. always yeah. live up to um, that, that I even see this in philanthropy. What would be frustrating to me is I literally would see white organizations with just a half an idea to come and get millions of dollars. And then I would see black organizations come to the table. We had to almost give our, the DNA and, and, and turn over the rights to our firstborn <laughs> and to prove how we had saved 10,000 people within the last 30 days to show that we were worthy yep. of resources. There is nothing wrong with giving grace and space for failure yep. or what is perceived. Because I don't know if I even put failure on it. I'm saying that because I think we are under any time people, I'm going to say it again, organized power is realized power. Organized power is realized power. Mm -hmm. And I'm raising that and stressing that because instead of us putting the pressure on ourselves to judge ourselves or whether we're effective or not, based on a system of oppression, systemic oppression. If we recognize that we're in protracted struggle, that you know when you push and you push and you push, push, right? And that as more people become politicized, as more people become organized, that things change. Sometimes I might not break the window out, right? But if I put a little crack in it, that window is that much more closer to being shattered. And so I would just say, Eve, to you, that part of doing this work is just doing the work. That oftentimes I'm doing the work, you know, of course I want to win. Like I am highly competitive and I'm a strategist. I'm just not doing this because I want to I want to <laughs> ride on a bus. I would absolutely love to be mm -hmm. in my home right now, in my bed, watching the last episode exactly. of Lovecraft. However, um, oh, yes. It, Right. It's, it's important for us to do this work. So I'll just say to you that I think for us, instead of judging grassroots groups, grassroots organizations by the traditional philanthropy standards, I'm all, we always look at a couple of things. We're looking at, are they rooted and centered in community? Who do they listen to? What are their values? We will hang with you, right? If you you did one race and you lost that race, we're not be like, all right, we out. No, we're looking at what did we learn from you losing in that race? What do we have to do as a strategy next time? Should we be focusing on something different? And so I am hoping that we shift our paradigm, right, from that we're, when we're dealing with the lives of people, that we're dealing with transformative change, that we move beyond this transactional win. We're obsessed with these transactional wins because it's like, okay, I won. Right, and what does that mean? When in fact, what we're trying to do is really have create transformative change. And so for us, with grassroots groups and organizations is their ability to organize, their ability to be able to envision something. Matter of fact, even envision something that it doesn't exist. There are a whole bunch of people that told folks who were doing defund the police that that was yeah. ludicrous. Exactly. That will never happen, yeah. right? The truth of the matter is what, whatever position you land on that right now, guess what? The whole nation is talking about this idea about defund the police. That is progress. And so we've got to really be able to me measure progress in a way that's gonna lead to us getting closer to transformation and not get so caught up in these transactional wins that sometimes don't move us as far as we think it will. Yeah, excellent. I Thank hope that you answers so much. your question. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your question, Eve. I'm going on to uh, Ibrahim um, uh, has a question. Thank you, Eve. Hi, Ibrahim. Hi. Um, thank you for being with us, Ms. Brown. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to you. Um, my question sort of touches upon something you talked about right at the end. Um, racism, xenophobia, sexism, and hate are embedded in the systems that dictate our lives many of these systems are built on discriminatory institutions that are also inherent and systemic within all of the systems that dictate our lives. So I guess my question is, how can grassroots organizing help address the intricacies of these systems? And how can uh, grassroots organizations and grassroots organizing tear down many of these systems that really need to be built back up from scratch? Thank you for that question. If you don't mind, 
I want to engage you in an exercise real quick. I want everybody to participate, but I want to engage you, Ibrahim. So I'm going to ask you, I want you to close your eyes. I want all of you all to close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you a question. I want everybody to close your eyes. I do this everywhere, so I'm going to ask you a question. All right. Now, with your eyes closed, this is my question to you. What does America look like without racism? Now open your eyes. Ibrahim, were you able to see me? I saw utopian it's future. Not a right wrong on I'm sorry. I saw utopian. I saw utopian future, but quite honestly, I don't think I know the answer to what America is without racism. That's right. Thank you for being honest in saying that. That everywhere I go, the majority of people, 99% of us can't see anything. I mean, and that's really indicative to how embedded structural racism is in this country. We cannot even imagine America without racism. That's just how, like, it is hard to even imagine, right? And I'm raising that because I, as part of the piece that, the answer I have for you, this cell phone, there is nothing that has been brought into the physical world that was first not envisioned in our mind. Nothing. These earrings I have on, someone envisioned it. It's kind of cute too, right? You see my face? Yeah, very cute. <laughs> um, um, the t-shirts that, that I have on, the truth of the matter is there was there is nothing that will be brought into the physical world that was not first envisioned. Part of, I think, our greatest challenge and our greatest opportunity is that oftentimes we have been so um, rooted and enamored in responding to racism that we have forgotten to dream. And so my next question to you is, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes again. And I want you to radically reimagine this nation. What would America look like, right? When you're talking about the America that you want to see, the America that you deserve and your family deserves, what does that look like? And I want you to open your eyes. I know it's not a lot, lot of time. We don't have that much time. That's why I'm, I'm doing this short, short version of it. But <laughs> Ephraim, if you could just share just a couple of things that came up for you when I asked that. Um, so um, as someone who is an international student, so my, fa my whole family isn't really in the United States, but as someone who is immigrating to the United States, I think the world, the America that I want to see is an America that is welcoming, that provides equal opportunity to all of its citizens and residents, that understands the value of human life and doesn't ask the question of, um, is giving someone the thing that they need worth it? Is the cost too high? And instead uses its status as the richest country in the world to just make life better for people and also people around the world because in many ways America's systems and all of it all of what it has done has also affected the lives of many people around the world. Thank you so much. That nation, that America you just talked about, that's where I want to live. That's what I want. That's what I think we deserve. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. That's what all human beings deserve. And so I'm raising that. Well, what two things I would note is when I asked you around your vision and to reimagine, you were like quick, right? Because you weren't stuck. You didn't have the barriers. You had the, you had the breath of the possibilities of imagination. So what I think that grassroots organizations need to do as we're doing this work, when we're talking about coming up against these systems, instead of us trying to rake our brains on trying to figure out how you can fix and paste together a broken window, right, that we also have to think about, we might need a new car, that we need new systems, that what is this economic system mm -hmm. that can actually take this wealth really in a way that the people of this country benefit from it? Like make, allow our minds to really be able to expand. I use this as an example last night. Like right now, what we know is technology has made it tremendously much different in terms of landscape around manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So let's say it took a hundred people to make 10 cars. Now, because of technology, it only takes a hundred people doing 40 hours a week. Um, it takes 10 people 40 hours a week to make a hundred cars. 
the other 90 people, we fire them. Why not we keep the 100 people and let the 100 people only work 10 hours a week and make the same amount of money or more? Yes, we can think that way. We can actually expand and shift the paradigm of where we're really thinking outside the box. And so I'm just raising this. Thank you for that question. That thank I think you, in order for us, yes, thank you. In order for us to shift, then we've got to literally be able to not be afraid to shift our mind to radically reimagine different systems. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask a final question. This is from Richard, and I apologize, Richard, for um, um, uh, going over you before. But uh, the final question, Richard asks, if we succeed in a blue wave, what legislation should begin to change the injustices that we've discussed tonight, voter suppression and, um, and all those types of things? What, if there was a blue wave, what would be the legislation that could begin um, to tackle these things? That's a good point. I will say I am going to depend on a people wave. I need a people wave <laughs> that, that, that I do think that, you know, if it is, and I understand the spirit of the question. The spirit of the question is if there's a change in terms of leadership and then there is the Democrats get in power. Um, as someone who I have been critical of both the Democrat and the Republican parties, the Republicans are just, on, on, on the Republican party is no longer a party. It's a that's a whole different workshop that you know I can yep. discuss, right? But but the, but the truth of the matter is, I do want us to even think beyond. Um, let me say this: regardless of what the outcome of November the fourth, November the third, or November the fourth, I know I've got to fight. Now, number November the fourth will determine how hard I got to fight, and who I got to fight, and what strategy mm -hmm. I have to fight. But November the 4th, I am going to have to be back at it and thinking about the policy that we need. What I am hoping, if there is a blue wave, um, I am hoping since the Democratic Party, the base of that party have been people of color and young folks, right, mm -hmm. um, L the LGBTQ community, that I am hoping that those that have stood with that party and make up the base of that party are also thought about and of that they are centered in the policy of going forward. I'm hoping that we will see a mm -hmm. comprehensive health care plan. I mean, what's mm -hmm. so bad about everybody having health care? Like, poor people yeah. that are sick and get well, I'm so confused. I don't understand for life for me. Why every, every, other, every other, you know, country um, in the world that is uh, competing, I mean, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> I just don't understand, like, literally, why would you not want sick people to be able to get well? I don't understand that. But one, I would hope that there's a comprehensive health plan to come out of there. I would hope that there is a serious um, um, investigation in the mass scale voter suppression all over this country. It continues to happen because those who are bad actors are never held accountable. So yes, I want to see some people prosecuted. Yes, I want some people called to the heel. Yes, I want to see some legislation that literally is expanding access to the ballot and not necessarily restricting the ballot. The third thing I want to see is I want to see an immediate pass of a stimulus package that literally is not about supporting corporations, but supporting people. We're, we're in the wealthiest yeah. country in the world. We're in the middle of COVID-19. That we should have a comprehensive package uh, that literally can jumpstart small businesses, that can feed into mm -hmm. everyday people, that can actually change these systems. I want to see radical changes that actually are in the benefit of human beings and people in this country, whether you live in Montana or if you live on the shores of South Carolina, there is enough mm -hmm. wealth and innovation in this country that if we match that with political will, I would like to see if there is a blue wave, that those are the three things, that there is more economic parity that, is, that are part of the agenda, that we really deal with this issue around voting rights and voter suppression, and that we fundamentally deal with the issue around health care and criminal justice Thank reform. You. I can go on and on and on. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Brown. It is a pleasure to talk to you. I'm so inspired by you, as I think everybody who's listened has been inspired by you. I am so I'd be more inspired that you're in your, your bus in Flint, Michigan. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to um, Tisch College and to our co-sponsors uh, for this event. And I'm so happy to have you here. Is there anything lastly you'd like to say? Um, before we let you go and go on with your with your um, no, in, in Michigan, no, the only the, the one the go one ahead. thing I would say was thank you, thank you all for who thank you for engaging this conversation with me for the work that you all are doing. You know, I really hope that this becomes a reflective moment 
um, in this country. That right now that people are suffering, that there are yep. children as we speak that are separated from their families mm -hmm. just because they had a different color passport. Um, mm -hmm. That there are children that are in cages. That I am yep. hoping, um, and I've been saying this recently, that we are driven by the concept of for the love of humanity, that we're mm -hmm. able to move beyond the partisan politics, we're able to move beyond kind of the oppressive, the divisive um, um, sound bites that we hear in this country, and that we reset. I'm hoping that we re reset and we realize mm -hmm. what's happening in this country. We can vote Trump out of office all we want, those of us who wanted to vote him out of office. Trump, is, Trump in itself is not the problem. He is, mm -hmm. a, he is a symptom of a larger problem in this country. He is, his, his racist rhetoric works because racism exists, right? Yes. The oppression, the, 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 all of those things exist, right? And so I am hoping that this becomes a reflection point for us in this country to recommit ourselves to really creating a real democracy, recognizing that democracy has not been actualized yet. We haven't realized um, our democracy yet. It has been, it's aspirational. And as long as we've got these systems in place, it will continue to be aspirational, right? But I want to achieve the democracy that the constitution lays out and we're not there yet. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And I thank you on behalf of Tufts and thank you everybody for coming and good luck. And, and we'll, we'll see you on the other side uh, uh, next week. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everybody. See you next week. See ya.